Hi there everybody, in this video we are comparing fibrous and globular proteins and I'm going to use examples of collagen which is a fibrous protein and haemoglobin which is a globular protein to compare them. So let's look at the structure of collagen first of all. So it's a fibrous protein and it's very important um, in our body as a structural protein. So it's involved in our skin, our tendons and so on. And collagen if we look at the uh, amino acid sequence, we have a very repetitive regular sequence of amino acids. So you can see here that um, we've got three amino acids which just repeat over and over again. And that means you end up with a, um, a protein which is very regular in its shape. And collagen is quite interesting because when you have, um, you don't just have a single polypeptide chain. Three polypeptide chains will come together and they will link together. And when they do that, they form a helix. So here's one of the polypeptide chains. So you can see that it's formed this helix shape. Okay, it's like a coil. It's not an alpha helix, um, as we talk about in our secondary structure of a protein. It's looser than that. So there's one of the polypeptide chains, but it joins together with two more. And this structure here, this whole structure where we've got three polypeptide chains coiled together, that's our triple helix. And if we were to think about where the amino acids would be, if we just look at one of those polypeptide chains, we could put three amino acids on there. Um, and they do have obviously specific names. So the green one here represents glycine. Um, and then you've got the orange one, which is proline. And the blue one I've used to represent alanine. And because of the uh, because the amino acids have got different R groups, because they're slightly different sizes, um, they fit together in a particular way. So the green glycine um, always ends up at the top of the the like the helix, if you think of it like that. And then again, you've got your the orange one, the proline, and then the alanine. So we could look at the the whole triple helix, and we could show where all of the glycines are up there. Then we've got all the prolines and all of the alanines. Um, and again, this you know this particular structure, this this uh, this triple helix, is very tightly wound and it's very compact. And that's because of the glycine molecules, which are regularly spaced out here. And glycine is um, a small amino acid. Okay, it's very very small because the R group on glycine is just a single hydrogen atom. So because we've got our glycine repeated throughout the primary structure, we end up with a very, very compact and tightly wound triple helix. Now this triple helix is what we call a collagen molecule. And then what we have is if this, oh sorry, yes, the other thing is that, so not only have we got it, it's obviously got to be bound together. So what you can see here is that um, amino acids on um, adjacent polypeptide chains, there are hydrogen bonds holding them together. So it's very compact anyway, but then you've got lots of hydrogen bonds holding that triple helix together, holding the collagen molecule together. Okay, let's say that this represents a collagen molecule. So this represents a triple helix. Um, in collagen, you have lots of these collagen molecules and they line up adjacent to one another um, and as you can see they're not adjacent there were sort of small gaps in between the molecules and this gap here is offset okay so they aren't all lined up like you know with a gap in the same place they are offset and that also helps with the strength it's a little bit like if you were going to lay a, a wall of bricks you would offset the bricks so you don't have the gaps in all the same places so each of these is a collagen molecule and then to hold all of those collagen molecules together, you again have lots of bonds. Um, but these are covalent bonds. Um, so these are very strong molecules holding together the collagen molecules. And when we have lots of collagen molecules held together by covalent bonds, we hold, call this whole structure a collagen fibril. If we then take one collagen fibril, so the collagen fibril is made up of lots of collagen molecules and each collagen molecule is made of three uh, collagen polypeptide chains. 
If this is a one fibril, then you have lots of fibrils all laying next to each other, which we call a collagen fiber. So in terms of um, the properties of collagen, as an example of a fibrous protein, um, we've already said that it is, is very strong. So it's very strong as a result of all the bonding that takes place um, because we've got such a regular repetitive sequence of amino acids. Um, it's, uh, we've got these long parallel strands. So you end up with, uh, th that's why it's fibrous. Okay, so it's like a fiber. It's very, very stable because it's so regular. Um, it also tends to be, so collagen is insoluble. So we don't have any uh, polar or hydrophilic groups sticking out, um, which could allow it to be soluble in water. So collagen and other fibrous proteins are insoluble. Um, and as we said at the beginning, um, they tend to have supportive and structural functions in the body. Okay, let's have a look at hemoglobin then. So hemoglobin is a globular protein. So in contrast to our fibrous proteins, um, we have uh, an irregular amino acid sequence, as you can see here. Okay, so the sequence is irregular. A hemoglobin molecule will always have exactly the same amino acid sequence as another, amino, uh, as another hemoglobin molecule, um, but that sequence is irregular. You don't have this repeating pattern within the sequence. As a result, um, you have a shape, a tertiary structure, um, which it forms this sort of globular shape. And it's not, as you can see, it's not, it's not a regular shape. It's an irregular shape. Now, the causes of this shape are to do with the amino acids and the R groups that are there. Now, in hemoglobin, um, because it's globular, one of the reasons for that is you've got lots of um, amino acids with R groups which are hyd hydrophobic and they form on the sort of inside because remember, this is a 3D shape. So all of these sort of brown um, amino acids here represent amino acids with hydrophobic R groups. And then amino acids with hydrophilic R groups they end up on the outside of our molecule. Okay, so these are hydrophilic R groups. So because of that, our globular proteins um, are usually water soluble because we have these hydrophilic uh, amino acids with hydrophilic groups on the outside. Now, if we're talking about hemoglobin specifically, Hemoglobin um, contains a prosthetic group. So this here represents um, our heme group. Um, so heme, a heme group contains an iron atom, an Fe2 plus, uh, sorry, an, an iron iron. So an Fe2 plus iron. So this is a non-protein group. And our heme group is therefore an example of a prosthetic group. Okay, so this is not just an iron ion. This is a heme group which contains um, an Fe2 plus ion. Now hemoglobin has actually got four polypeptide chains. So what you can see here, um, we had one there and then here's another one. Both of these are alpha hemoglobins. Okay, so they're alpha polypeptide chains. Hemoglobin then has two what we call beta globin chains. And the two beta globin chains also have a heme group. So we've got two alpha globin chains and two beta globin chains. They're just slightly different in their structure. Each chain has a heme prosthetic group. Each heme prosthetic group is able to bind with one oxygen molecule. So this whole thing, when we talk about hemoglobin, this whole thing is a hemoglobin molecule, but it's made up of four polypeptide chains. So this means that one hemoglobin molecule is able to transport a maximum of four oxygen molecules. 
So we've already said that hemoglobin, um, as an example of other globular proteins, they tend to be water soluble. And we've obviously got this spherical three dimensional shape. Um, it's quite unstable. So as a result of the R groups, we'd have lots of, um, there'd be lots of ionic bonds in there. We've got our hydrophobic interactions. So it is much more unstable compared to a fibrous protein. And in terms of the function of globular proteins, they tend to have metabolic functions. Okay, so um, enzymes, for example, are globular proteins, um, all enzymes. Hormones are often globular proteins, antibodies, um, and then here we've got our hemoglobin example. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much.